So two things I love in life. One, options. Two, the 80s. Now, obviously, you know, wife and daughter would be on that list as well, but uh, for the purpose of this review, two things, the 80s and options. You say options, what are you talking about, Brian? Well, I love options. The idea of, you know, in one drawer, one little location, you could have something for grilling, also for barbecue. Barbecue is not a hot dog, by the way. We know this down here in the South. Pie, you know, you can serve pie with this option. You know, this one cuts pizza. Maybe you have this one in this hand, and I don't know, you could serve pasta with that one. And, you know, all this other stuff. You say, Brian, what does that have to do with anything? And what does it have to do with the 80s? Well, behind me here, you can see Space Freaks from Stronghold Games. Bright neon pink, right? Reminiscent art of the 80s sci-fi. What is Space Freaks about, Brian? And why are you talking about options and grilling and left hand right hand oh that's because today we're taking a look inside of space freaks what it is what it does and why i won't spoil it this time i normally spoil it well let's go right now space freaks So normally in a review video, a good review video I should say, someone comes on the screen, does a narrated voiceover that's scripted and well put together, but that's not what's gonna happen because Space Freaks is all about versatility. You say versatility, how, Brian? Well, Space Freaks is a four person beat em up game amid a map with cards and robots and aliens and all this sort of stuff. And you just fight to win, fight to get the most victory points. But let's look for a minute at what I'm talking about, why I keep bringing up options right now. So inside of this glorious space pink box are a few things I want to show you, but let's look real quick at the art. There's a very important thing to notice. Notice the human head, crazy different right arm here, shield up here, robot body, and crazy looking legs shooting the tentacles off of something. Normally this is just generic art, but no, no, no. Arena of Annihilation is all about that. First of all, a couple different things to notice. This is a stronghold game, but this is very thick cardboard. Excellent job. Look at this. Look at this places to put cards or you know the arena master and there's stuff about the arena master you know it tells you flavor text it's got this kind of world built in and the instruction book it has a comic book but here's what i wanted to show you everybody gets a board now on the back it kind of has your story of your race and all that sort of stuff but it also tells you your sponsor very cool evocative art reminds you of something like i don't know fallout or nuketown or any retro 50s sci-fi art and i love it it's one of my favorite things is just the fact that the art is very stylistic on purpose. Some people give Food Chain Magnate a lot of grief because it's like, you know, 1950s. Well, this is 1950s done with a lot of color and a lot of art and a lot of added stuff to it. So, here's what I want you to see. Everybody gets one of these sheets with these blank spots. A head, a torso, a right arm, and a left arm, and feet. Also has player aids on it. Here's why this is so exciting, why this is, again, I can't spoil it, but let's talk about it right now, how this works. First thing of note, there are two size cards. There are the small size cards and the large size cards. Small size cards always have to do with body parts of your character. Large size cards are things that we'll talk about in a minute. But first of all, at the beginning of the game, everyone gets dealt a head card. Notice the head cards are not colored to be a specific colored uh, player. So everyone gets a head card. The head cards are things like this. For instance, self-destruct is great head, right? teleportation, toxic, it tells you all these different things that your head gives you. They all give you sort of this little power and a little bonus. They also have a number in the top, right? This is who is the first player uh, in kind of in, it determines who the first player is and then it goes clockwise from that point on, but that's important to know. Uh, charm, I love it. So all these different heads. So you would get your head and you would put it out onto the board, onto the head slot there. And you then have your deck of cards with all the other body parts, the torsos, legs, you know, uh, left arms and right arms. What you do then is you go through and you find what you want to play as based on what these things give you and put it on your freak, your space freak. And this is such an amazing mechanic because it seems simple. You go, well, of course, you would just, it's just like having a deck of cards like Arena of the Gods, but there's something about doing this that is just so incredibly special in this game and why I love it. So you build your space freak and you actually get a visual representation of your space freak. So let's just put one together and I'll explain what the different numbers do. And you can see your space freak. And each of them have this, everybody's is different, you know, depending on what cards they pick. So you can see how awesome that is. And you have so many different combinations. I can't 
quite figure out the math on it because I haven't looked at the amount of cards there are, but you're talking about pretty large factorial of different combinations that this could be. Now, let's talk about kind of what this does. So R free currently, he would have the self-destruct power. We'll talk about what that does in a minute. But his range is six, his damage is six, or he does a strike. That is a symbol that has to do with uh, attacking things that aren't space freaks, basically. He also has the retaliation trait. So if you do a damage to him, he will do one retaliation back to them. This increases his range. His health is 14. There's also the little question mark means that there's a reference for it in the rule book. He has seven movement, a plus two health. So his health is 16, actually. He has a one for luck, and he starts with three um, project cards, or, or three, I'm sorry, I lost their name. Three sponsor cards. That is our freak. Your freak will stay this way unless one of these arena cards tells you to switch the head or you play a sponsor card, which allows you to reconstruct your right arm or left arm or things like that. So this is such a cool concept. And so, you know, you have so many different combinations of things that this could be. You know, it could be that, or it could be this, and it could be, you know, this. And your freak could be different every single time you play with different stats. And that is such a cool concept. So let's look at how you actually play this game on the table. One thing of note, there's not a lot of stuff that gets put out on the board. This is pretty much the setup in a two-player game. You would play opposite sides of each other. There's some terrain to notice on the board. You've got radiation spots. You've got medical centers. You've got research laboratories and the landing zone. The map is two-sided. The other side of the map has a lot of different things on it, like some walls and such things as that. But uh, there's also mountains. The other thing is on these little dots right here, that is your building area. And the closer dots to your home base, that is, in fact, your home base zone. That's it. That's the setup, pretty much. Now, what are you doing your turn? So the turns work like this. On the tracker here, this is your score tracker up here, the round tracker here. The person with the most points at the end of six rounds wins the game. At the beginning of each round, you will turn over arena master cards, which looks something like this. So this is teleporter science. Each round, you'll turn over one of these arena master cards and they'll do different effects like this. And there's a whole ton of them, as you see. Teleporter science lets you use healing laboratories or laboratories and healing centers as wormholes, basically. Uh, let's see, alien mines. All this, at the start of each player's cleanup step, all of their freaks occupying the landing zone take five damage. So it's just different things that change the rules of the game. The damage from the radiation hexagons is increased from three to six. So if you have somebody who can move characters from one space to another, it's a good way to do damage without it being an attack. Alien gifts, all players draw one sponsor card. So all kinds of great things that change the rules of each round. A few things to note. There's a couple ways to score victory points. You get a victory point for destroying each enemy freak, uh, each strike to an enemy home base. So basically if you do a damage to the other player's home base token, you can actually land there. The hex, it's always in the corner right over here. It would be there on someone else's. Uh, you get a victory point as well. For each landing zone hex occupied by a player's freak at the end of that player's turn, that would be these four spaces here, you get a point. For completing each mission, you get a point, or depending on if it's an advance when you get two points. And then down here at the end of the game, for each enemy home base zone, that's this zone behind these first row of dots, at the end of the game, for each freak you have in someone else's zone, you get two points. Now let's look at the mission cards because the first phase you do in your turn is the mission phase. Everyone's always gonna have three mission cards in their hand at all times, um, unless you play one, which you have to play. So technically you have two in the middle of your turn and you'll draw back up. But the point is these are things like this. Retrieve a prototype from the laboratory to the right of your home base. Basically enter the hexagon of a laboratory to the right of your home base somewhere. Uh, so you can see that for the green player, that would be this laboratory right here. If they go there, you would be able to do it. So the way it works is at the beginning of your turn, you'll play one of your three mission cards down in front of you. You will hope to accomplish that during your turn. It can stay for another turn, and they do stack. So if you had, for instance, multiple sabotage cards laid out over a couple different turns, and you completed, let's say, inflict a uh, strike to the home base to the player to your left, you would, in fact, score it twice. It gives you two points each time. Actually, these are different. Sorry, this is to the left and this is to the right, but some of them are exactly the same. You would score them twice. When you score, you will also get a sponsor card. Sponsor cards are these cards that can be done anytime during your turn as long as you don't break the one golden rule of you cannot attack an actual attack more than once per freak. So you actually activate all three of your freaks. Plus, if you have one of these sponsor cards that allows you to drop a droid or an alien out there, you'll get a chance to do that too. So jetpack, you know, you can move five more spaces, additional spaces, and you can move over the rock terrains, which normally you can't. 
uh, antimatter detonator. So remove the freak from the board and all adjacent targets take 12 damage or two strikes. So strikes, normally buildings like turrets and, and uh, bunkers take two strikes to destroy, so that would kind of automatically kill that. Plus it does 12 damage. Uh, things like this. So it gets a range of 15. It does 12 damage or two strikes to the target hexagon. So it just it's massively powerful things, plus some support things as well. Alien Scythe, you know, really cool stuff. Some bombs. I'm trying to find the one that I really want to show you um, is Field Surgery. And I'm trying to think where that one is. But it's one of the, here it is, Field Surgery. So mid-game, you decide, crud, I don't, I'm not liking the choice that I made on my arm. I need to switch it out. Change your left arm or right arm of your freak. So last night, I accidentally picked one that I didn't realize didn't have any range, which wasn't a problem because I had some ways to get about it. But had I wanted to, I could have played this to switch my right arm or left arm for a different arm vis-a-vis -vis basically different weapons. So <laughs> look at the art, I love that. You just sew it on middle of the road. And that's it, so these are, these sponsor cards just do different things. You get to play as many as you want during your turn, um, as long as you don't break that rule of attacking twice. Down here on your card is all the different symbols you will encounter while playing the game. Things like you know victory points, hit points, damage, there's armor. Basically that's your soak value. If you soak something based on your armor, if somebody has three damage, you have a armor of one, you only take you know one. Armor piercing damage means you shoot through that. Uh, strike, we talked about that. Retaliate, we talked about that. That attack symbol means that you can only do one attack per turn even, so if the ability has that ability on it, you can't well, double it up. Heal, so if you go to the medical center, you can heal up to three, place, uh, three damage. Range, line of sight, this means you don't have to have line of sight to do it. So normally line of sight would be just straight line as long as nothing impedes it. This does not impede it, but uh, mountains and other buildings do. Movement symbol, enemy freak. So a lot of times it'll say things like, you know, uh, 15 or three range within no line of sight of an enemy freak. So basically that means you can pull without having line of sight to any enemy freak within three spaces. It's kind of worded funny, and you have to do the translation yourself, but that's kind of what it means. Move through rocks, sponsor cards, attack through obstacles. Luck means you draw another sponsor card when you would draw one. And then help means there's a place in there. Also, all the stats for the buildings, the droids, and the aliens down here. And that's it, that's what you do. On your turn, you will activate all of your freaks. These, it's also pretty handy, because you'll notice each of them has a base. With different colors on it that way you know which freak has what health so you can track everything in one spot and it's got wooden cubes so technically there's some euro elements to this right that's right anyway that's the game you activate you keep going around you fight you fight you fight if one of your freaks dies they go back off the board and at the end of your turn you will get a chance to put your freaks back into your zone which effectively means if they die during someone else's turn you could potentially lose your entire turn so, let's talk about what we think of this game. One thing of note is how incredibly great the detail is on these sculpts. I mean, they're simple, right? They're generic, but if you look close, all four body parts are different things, and that is such a cool idea. So you get the tentacle arm hanging down, the Mega Man booster, the armor, the boots, everything. The components in this game are absolutely top-notch and well-deserving of praise and attention. So, so far, Brian, you mentioned options and 80s. Right now, currently, I only see the 80s because of this pretty color on the outside. I don't really get the feel of the 80s. Well, let me just put it to you this way. Herbert West, Reanimator. No, I'm not talking about the 1930s slash 20s because I'm not sure when it was published. Story by Lovecraft. I'm talking about the 80s and 70s horror and sci-fi genre of this crazy creature feature alien stuff where you stitch your planets together and granted this is probably more popular in pulp sci-fi from the 1950s but something about that hot pink really just I love it but you secondly mentioned options and here's something else I wanted to note they've done a great job by the way about the art all throughout the player's guide here, the instruction booklet, but it's also very helpful. Every single one of the symbols is explained as well as almost every one of the cards that you might have a question about are in here and really well explained. But you say, Brian, options, I don't understand. You pretty much play the same thing over and over. I mean, yeah, sure, you get to pick your different stuff. Like, you know, sometimes I may want to play with cumin or the next time I want to play with Bucky's barbecue and rib rub, but you know, is it really any different than the steak rub? Well, that's the thing you've got to wonder. Just because there's two different art cards, you know, one for the left arm that's different than the last time you played it, and it does a little bit different, is it really that different? Yes. Your play style changes dramatically. And here's the thing. This is one of those games where as soon as you finish it the first time, you go, I really want to play it again. 
because the first time you could almost just randomly deal freak cards out to everybody for the whole body. And then after that, you go, oh, wait a minute, I see how this stuff combos, I see how this stuff plays, and then you start building your freaks, and now I imagine there's probably gonna be some sort of a metagame when it comes to freaks. Now, I've been told by a certain Mr., we'll call him Beaven Stonicor, that, you, uh, that some people might get angry, and maybe not particularly angry, but like, uh, let's just call them Vom Tassel, right? And they, they might get upset if, not upset, but they might be playing a game and realize, hey, wait a minute, I just attacked your guys, three each, but you just did three damage back to me each because of retaliation. So it's a beautiful thing where you might not be expecting it sometimes to do pretty well just on your defensive powers. You say, Brian, what does that have to do with anything? Here's what it has to do with it. The fact that I feel like we're going to get a meta game out of this to where people go, wait, no, this is the freak. This is the best freak combination, and you need to do that. Now, will that create problems? Of course it will. Yeah, of course it's going to create problems. People go, well, oh, this game is broken. I never want to play with this game again. All you have to do is put the right arm with the little ice chest. and It's going to be annoying to hear that, but you know what? You don't have to play like that. It's the same way when I play Hero Clicks and the same way with X-Wing. You don't have to play a meta game. You can play a fun game, which brings me to the point about this game that I've been trying to say the whole video. And that is not that I, I don't like this video, this game. I love it. I mean, I love it. Yeah, I know that was corny, right? That's cliche to say, I don't like this, I love it. But I love this game. It's like a 9.5 for me. It's so fantastic, even though Every time you play, you're pretty much doing the same thing, but there's just enough variation with the mission cards you play and the characters you pick and the, the other players and how they play their cards and the arena cards and the um, sponsor cards. There's enough variation just in this box, base box, and I am so hoping uh, Lada Pelé, Dutch Finland, and Stronghold makes expansions to this because this is a game that will absolutely benefit from expansions to where you don't just have Bucky's, but maybe you have some, I don't know, anti-itch powder cream spray stuff and you say Brian what does it have to do with anything that was a really weird analogy my point is this what if the expansion gave you more of the same yes but with just enough of a tweak on it you say Brian that's what all good expansions do exactly this game will be perfect for expansions you said Brian does it need expansions I thought good games were not supposed to need expansions but stand on their, their alone okay it's 2017 I think we all pretty much at this point go, you know what, if a game's great, I'm fine with getting an expansion. Do you have to play the expansion? Of course not, but, 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 but this is all gilding the lily. I'm, I'm getting too wordy here at the end. You absolutely need to play Space Freaks. This is one of my top games of the year. It's fast, I dropped the box, but look at it, it's great. It's fast, it's fun, it's silly in a good way, but it's also strategic. You have to put a lot of thought into what you're doing. And that's why I think Space Freaks wins the arena combat game of the year. I know that's not a real genre, but it is the arena combat game. It's one of my favorite multiplayer games this year, period. Hands down, go get Space Freaks. I cannot recommend this game enough. It is so much fun. And just knowing that there's so much next time you can do each time you play to get a better and better and better freak and play better and play a different strategy, it makes it so great. It says it takes an hour. It took us a little bit longer the first time we played because of the idea of you know, asking questions. Well, how does this rule interact with this? How does this rule interact with that? But once everybody starts playing their turns, it goes pretty fast. You activate your three freaks, you go. This is somebody else's turn. Space Freaks, Stronghold, Lada Pelikdat, Finland. I cannot recommend this enough. Go buy this game. If it's at Essen, pick it up on my recommendation alone. And if you don't like it, don't pick it up on my recommendation and pick it up on Shut Up and Sit Downs or something like that. So until next time, that's Brian Drake with the latest retro with Space Freaks. Absolutely love this game. I've said it 15 times, but go get it. I'm getting repetitive because it's getting late and we're headed out of town tomorrow for like eight days and my mind is gone. So go there, check it out now. If you want to follow us where we're doing our magic stuff, go to briandrakeshow.com. But for more, check us out at the latest retro. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.